Hi everyone, um, welcome to the second free event of the publishing conference hosted by Comma Press and Manchester Metropolitan University's publishing MA programme. Um, this event is on how to break into the publishing industry and I'm joined by three panellists, Raki Vadira, who is HR business partner at Pan Macmillan, Susie Asbury, managing director of Inspired Selection and Anne Ashworth, who is head of employee apprenticeships at Pearson. Um, I'll be asking questions to our three panelists for the first hour, then at 12 we'll move on to questions from the audience. So if you think of any questions while we're talking, please just leave these in the YouTube chat um, and we'll try and ask as many as possible as we can at the end. Before we start, I'll just quickly introduce myself. I'm Rosie, my pronouns are she, her, and I am currently co-chair of SYP North, which is the Northern branch of Society of Young Publishers. Society of Young Publishers is a nationwide society. Um, we're focused on helping people get into the publishing industry or head in the publishing industry. Uh, it's for anyone within their first kind of five years of being in the publishing industry, age doesn't matter. Um, and we offer things like events, similar to these ones, we do panel events, but we also do book clubs, trying to kind of get a community of publishing hopefuls, uh, mentorships, which is completely free and we pair um, people new in publishing or people looking to get into publishing with people with much more experience and we offer advice and information through our blog and also our magazine imprint um, and we also try and campaign for book job transparency so making sure that all book jobs are telling you the salary that they're going to pay you um, if you want to find out more um, you can follow us on twitter it's syp underscore uk for the whole uk branch and SYP North for lunch. Um, great, so I will pass you over to our panelists for some introductions. Uh, Raki, if you'd like to go first. Hi, thank you, Rosie. Hi, everyone. I'm Raki. I am she, her, my pronouns. I work at Pam Macmillan as a HR business partner, which essentially um, is the same as a HR manager, kind of partnering a bit more with business. I have been, at, I just had, to, I think then, how long I'd been at Pam Mac, been at Pam Mac for just over five years. Um, and I am not um, traditionally from a publishing background. HR anyway, I guess, doesn't matter where you come from in terms of background, but I was in financial services before and I've taken the right plunge into the creative industry. So yeah, that's me. Thank you. Um, Anne, if you'd like to go next. Morning everyone, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I'm from Pearson, I've been with Pearson for about four and a half years uh, and joined them as head of the Employee Apprenticeship Programme because of my background in apprenticeships and government funded learning. Used to run my own consultancy company that really focused in on quality improvement of learning programmes. I'm also a liveryman with the Worshipful Company of Stationers and Newspaper Makers, so very involved in anything to do with the communications, media, publishing, printing sector. Brilliant, that's great. Uh, Susie, if you'd like to... Sure. Good morning, everybody. My pronouns are she and her, and I am the managing director of Inspired. I've um, been the MD there for uh, 11 years um, in May this year, so quite a while. And uh, my uh, before that, I was in publishing myself. So I've worked in publishing as well as publishing recruitment. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so first, I just wanted to ask, I think um, with apprenticeships and recruitment, so Anne and Susie, um, I think lots of people maybe don't know that much about how they kind of work with publishing. So I wondered if you could both say a bit about how Inspired Selection help people get into publishing and also how a Pearson apprenticeship works. Sure. Shall I, shall I go first, just about Inspired? Um, so Inspired Selection is um, a publishing specific recruitment agency. And um, so that means that everybody who works there is helping people get either their first jobs in publishing or a, a more senior level role so we work from entry level all the way up to board level and we we recruit for the the kind of CEOs as well but on a on a headhunting basis so that's executive search but for 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 this um uh discussion really um we're 
um, all specialist in in publishing recruitment. So we've either come from a background in publishing, or we often actually recruit some of the candidates <laughs> that are in publishing that want to, to move out into. I know, sorry, Racky, terrible, <laughs> um, but we like we like working with our candidates so much. Sometimes they'll come and then work for us. So they've they've got an understanding of the industry from from a, a kind of passionate place, if you like. Like we we all really enjoy working in in the publishing industry so we can what we can do is sort of really give you expert advice along the way um but everybody's trained in recruitment as well and that means that um when you're a candidate of ours we'll tell you about all the different roles that there are we can explore actually where your best energy is spent and help you sort of through like where you might be best to kind of look at rather than just one route because a lot of people obviously when they're joining um, publishing tend to think about editorial roles but we'll explore all the different types of roles like production or marketing PR sales that design even and and just make sure that you because it's really hard I think the hardest thing when you're starting out in in your career is knowing what you want to do and I think sometimes even at my age it's like I don't really know what I want to do in in my career but I've I've followed where it feels good and where I enjoy spending my time um, and and that's turned into a career so I think like we're really good at sort of drawing out your real strengths um, and and trying to help you find that career and and the other thing just to, to end up is is that you know even if we don't help you find that first job we we view you know it as a lifelong kind of relationship whilst you're in publishing um, and our aim is always at whatever point we we kind of meet years to kind of be recruiting for your team um, with that sort of long-term view so hopefully that kind of just gives you an outline that we're publishing experts helping people get jobs either at the start of their career or whatever point in their career that they need uh, another job. That's great. Thank you so much. I think you're so right. It can feel so daunting if you know that you want to work in publishing, but yeah. there are these departments and they're all so different, really. So yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> um, and if you want to talk a bit about the apprenticeship, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Pearson is known in the UK for being an awarding organisation predominantly, but actually we're an international company. Publishing is part of what we do, but not all that we do. <clears throat> so anybody that's actually looking for a career in publishing has opportunities to do other things. And as Susie said, you know, a publishing company still has HR, still has finance, still has marketing. Um, so, you know, we, we have all of those roles that are either in the publishing elements of our business, which tend to be educational, obviously, um, but we're very much into digital So we're very much moving into digital learning, um, blended learning, learning platforms um, on an international scale. I mean, we work in 70 different countries. And I think for young people, when they're thinking about career, sometimes just forget that actually big organizations can give them huge opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's about coming in, getting your foot in the door and then exploring, as Susie said, you know, what fits you at one point might not fit you later on, or you're unclear. So coming into our business gives us opportunities to actually have people moving around. And we've had a number of our um, apprentices that work in that part of the business. Some are doing the publishing assistant apprenticeship, but some also do the digital marketeer apprenticeship because there's a very much a really good crossover there. Um, And already they've moved on into other roles in the business. Um, And one's actually moved into another company, but I'm very pleased that we managed to sort of help that move out and we still hear from him and he's also passed his apprenticeship with flying colors and got a distinction so it's it's a it's a very closed community actually publishing i mean i work with quite a number of other publishing companies when we get together to talk about the publishing assistant which is actually going through a review of that apprenticeship at the moment as well so it gives us an opportunity as employers to really decide how we want the content of that apprenticeship to suit the needs of the 21st century from a, a publishing expertise perspective Brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, I'm actually currently doing um, a publishing assistant apprenticeship um, and I didn't didn't even know that they existed before. I think people often see the route into publishing as such a specific kind of like path and apprenticeships are really kind of helping to change that, I think. So, yeah, that's great. 
Um, so I wanted to kind of move on to your own experiences um, as people who've got into the publishing industry and are now kind of on the recruiting side of things. Um, and just ask how you secured your first jobs in publishing um, and what you've learned since then. Raki, if you'd like to go first on that one. Mine was just complete fake. I just winged it, basically. Um, <laughs> I was in financial services and don't discredit anyone that's in that industry. It's great, but it is intense. You know, you have to be a certain kind of person to really flourish in that industry. And Honestly, it just took a bit of a toll on my mental health and I just have become not a very nice person because essentially because of the rat race culture in that industry. Um, and so I decided to take the plunge and take uh, my dad's just pop a little window, sorry. Um, my, I decided to take the plunge and do a fixed term contract. So I essentially applied for maternity cover at Plan Macmillan um, and then never left. So it was a good risk to take. I think there was a little bit of a, concern about leaving a role that you're in to take a fixed term contract or if it's a permanent role but actually fixed term contract at the very least amazing experience and exposure and so I was willing to kind of take that risk to get something on my CV to get into the creative industry mm. um but obviously it worked out quite well for me but even if it hadn't that like nine to twelve months on your CV shouldn't be discredited because I think we look at a lot of people who have done stints or done covers and actually that's such valuable experience so I think either way it was a very calculated risk on my part um but no regrets like very happy that I took the risk great that's great to hear um Susie if you'd like to go next sure um well I came out of university um with a media and theatre degree not knowing what I wanted to do but I knew I wanted to be in the creative industries um and so I was interviewing a, a publishing company a, an advertising agency a marketing agency um and I actually got offers from all of them which I don't think kind of happens anymore <laughs> at that time. There were, it was a, a very different uh, world, you know, it was um, sort of booming. Um, and so it was a really difficult decision, a very nice uh, problem to have, obviously. But um, I actually chose the luxury advertising agency because I was just really wowed by the, how cool they were. And I lasted two days. It was like, not for me at all and then I rang the, co the publishing company up and said I've played a terrible mistake actually I really want to come work for you is it too late and they said no the position's still open so please come so I was really lucky um, to kind of get that second opportunity type thing but I, I joined as a, a PA so a pub, um, not a publishing assistant a personal assistant to the um, finance director and creative director and it was such a great role because it really gave me an overview of the entire publishing um, process so when we look at the apprenticeships and things like that um, I think that's brilliant because you're just going to get that fantastic overview and I think that was really the best start for me because I didn't have to decide right there and then what I was going to do but what I the reason I got the job is because I had I had touch typing I had all the skill the admin skills to be able to to get that job and I'd sort of always worked in the holidays um in, in a doctor's reception surgery and, and also at university um, I did like tour coordinating for a, a theatre company so just a bit of admin so I looked at what skills I did have and then and then managed to get that role in um, and then I realised now I really do like marketing and I quite like sales so with, after 18 months I moved within the company and this is a publisher called Corto um, and I moved there into one of the children's publishing divisions called QED as a sales and marketing coordinator and I loved it, it was great. Um, because the, the books were all about children's education and things like that. And it was great because I was doing both sales and marketing and it sort of appealed to my creative side. Um, and then a friend of mine who was at a different publishing company said, oh, there's this um, maternity cover for a rights role. I said, oh, I've not done rights before. They'd be like, you'd be fine at it. <laughs> just let's just apply because it'd be great to work with you so I did and I got that role so then I moved to another company called Michael O'Mara um, in a foreign rights role and I stayed in foreign rights then for a couple of years um, before moving into publishing recruitment so I could go on but I mustn't and that's 
that's how I've ended up here and I love I love recruitment like it, it's it's creative it's salesy it's marketing it's everything that's great that's such a kind of lesson in how transferable all those skills yeah are. yeah yeah um yeah and um what about you I know you said you don't have a publishing background as such yeah I was gonna say yeah. I, I mean my road into Pearson has has traveled very many different pathways I have to say mm. I actually started off um when I left school as an apprentice so a long long time ago working for the Atomic Energy Authority but wow. my dream was always to join the Navy so <sighs> became a Wren in um, 1980, saw through the Falklands War, got married, decided that probably I needed to do something else, and then went into printing. And uh, as you're saying, Susie, about um, PA role, that's exactly the role that I had, working for the chairman, but also the production manager, and got a really, really good handle on the whole aspect of printing, Mm -hmm. from the design and the binding all the way through the printing technology as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was really, really interesting. But another thing that I always wanted to do was going to teaching. And so that's what I did. So I ended up being a teacher for quite a number of years in post-16, um, and seeing through quite a number of the vocational changes that have sort of set the, the foundations of our current apprenticeship programme and also the new T-levels that have come into play. Mm. Um, and so I worked through that, became an inspector for um, apprenticeships many moons ago and then became an Ofsted inspector and then started up my own company, as I said earlier. And then with that, um, obviously supported an awful lot of organisations with their learning programmes, Pearson being one. And there was an opportunity with all the changes that were coming in with apprenticeships to to actually join Pearson. Mm. And the thing that I have really loved, actually, is that I'm in an organisation that's all about learning. Um, And for me, that that is what makes me tick. Actually being able to see people doing as well as they could do, but could do even better. And they do. And so aspirations being met, definitely transferability of skills and knowledge most definitely and that social mobility aspect so you know working with people that all of us are about learning and helping other people is quite inspiring and you know that is the motivational element that is the enthusiasm and if people come to us for an apprenticeship or any other role actually and have that 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 is the key driver that enthusiasm for helping other people to be better than they ever thought they could be is is what gets us up in the morning that's brilliant that's amazing um and yeah i think really um kind of common theme in what you were all talking about is those skills and and yeah transferable skills and i think often people looking to get into the publishing industry it can feel kind of like you're expected to be a sort of fully formed um publisher (laughs) when you're applying for entry-level jobs and it's really um good to hear about you talking about different skills rather than sort of having this many months experience at this specific publisher and so kind of on that theme um I wondered what kind of skills and experience but mostly skills you think publishers are looking for in entry-level applications and um what you're looking for when um you're looking at those applications or apprenticeship um, applications I mean, again, it's it depends on which part of the business. I mean, if we're looking at our educational side, then having some knowledge of the topic area is is sometimes needed. So we might need a a degree or at least really good evidence of an understanding of sciences, maths, Mm. modern foreign languages, etc. But that's not always the case. And what we work really hard with our hiring managers is to look at the aptitude, the enthusiasm, where an individual will fit, not just in the team as it is now, but where the team is is developing to over a period of time. I mean, we're going through uh, interesting changes in Pearson. We've got a new CEO that joined us last year. Um, And there's some really exciting things that are happening. And you know, bringing young talent in and and diverse talent, you know, apprenticeships are not just for young people, you can actually do an apprenticeship at any age over the age of 16, and also hold a degree as well. So that's a real departure that has opened up the opportunities for people to join us. So I think it's very much that that aptitude, that enthusiasm. I mean, obviously, having a good understanding of um, learning and, and that enthusiasm for it, digital skills, yeah, great, but you don't have to have a whole raft of them because you quite rightly say, Rosie, it's about the development. 
and our managers know that they need to put a lot of development time into individuals to get the the end result if you like which is you know not necessarily at the end of the apprenticeship it will continue yeah yeah brilliant thank you um Raki what would you say you're kind of looking for in those when you're looking at level it's so interesting because I think if you'd asked me this before the pandemic I would have had a different a different answer but I think really and truly just honesty so having a really honest application so that you're we really understand someone's baseline because I think as an employer it's our responsibility to get everybody to like a certain level of understanding a certain level of um ability to do like an office kind of role so that's like email etiquette communication all of that kind of stuff I think we have a responsibility to get you up to that baseline but we need to know where you're at for you to, when you come in so I think it's just honesty in your application so um, I always say to people, always ask for a job description when you apply for a role so that you can really tailor your covering letter and talk about your transferable skills. So even if you've never had um, people apply for a job before, I think all jobs are proper jobs, but you know, <laughs> everyone's had some kind of exposure to having to like coordinate something at sixth form or be involved in a club at university or even attended an event or something at university and what you've learned from that, what your role was and how you would then apply those skills that you picked up into a particular job. And I think being really honest about your willingness to learn, a situation where you've been able to learn and grow quite quickly, your technology skills, as I'm alluded to, I think having all of that really written out, honestly, is like your first step because it's our role as an employer to get you to understand the job properly, to get you the knowledge that you need to be able to do that role um, and then for you to be able to build on that. So I think it's about um, willingness to learn, honesty, um, and kind of just an interest. And I know that sounds really silly because in publishing, obviously if you even know about publishing as an area you want to be in, you kind of need to have a bit of an interest in books, but like a genuine interest in the area that you're going into or a, lot, a level of understanding about the role or the company is always really helpful for you then to be able to talk about how to transfer your skills. So attending things like this, that's also a really good thing to put in your covering letter because you've actually learned a little bit about an industry and it's shown that you've taken time out for yourself to kind of on a Sunday morning when you could probably be having a light in you know you've taken time out to come on and listen and understand about publishing so don't discredit the little things because the little things actually add up to be to show something about your character or show something about your personality so if you'd asked me that before the pandemic I think my answer would have been really different but I think it's shown us that this year we need to do more as an employer as well as have this baseline of understanding of what somebody can do coming in. Yeah, that's great. I think it's that, um, yeah, learning how to talk about things that might not have seemed like big experiences at the time. I think the best advice anyone gave me from my mum actually was um, just whenever you have a new experience like that to just write everything down, like every skill that you learn from it. And I found when I came to write applications, um, that was just so helpful to have that so yeah that that rings true from my experience um Susie what about you um I mean I'd agree with absolutely everything you guys have just said there um and I think Raki you're you're absolutely right that there are more important skills now that we need in this environment as work as work life changes you know there's there's going to be a lot more flexibility and so I think those like being able to trust somebody so that openness that honesty is like really really key if you if you're you know quite junior in your career like we need to be able to know that this person can work you know in a hybrid type of environment um or if that's not going to work for you you know if you if you're in a house share type thing and you can't work from home then that honesty to say I really want to come and work with you but I need to be in the office five days a week because I don't have the you know that maturity to to kind of show what your needs are to do the best that you can be in in the role um We'll say that responsible kind of approach, mature, um, really good communicator. So um, somebody like Wacky was saying with the, you know, the correspondence and just emailing and making sure that you are thanking people in a timely manner for any interaction of acknowledgement of, of application or an interview and things like that. It's really, these are all little things um, that, that really do make a difference. But I think as well, um, the kind of baseline um, skills we're looking for 
still are you know that communications the initiative um creativity um being really comfortable with data um as well so if you haven't got your kind of excel based skills it's a really good thing to have um because in every single role in publishing you're going to be using excel most likely um and i think the other thing that's really come out is um that publishing is a business and yes while we look for people that are passionate about books or interested in books or if it's an audio book publisher um you know the, the you listen to audio um that is really important but I actually I think what people are really impressed by is is marrying that with you know this is a business it needs to make money it needs to be commercially successful uh, and I want to be part of that um so that I mean I think that would be be my my kind of to, to add on to already a great list of things um yeah. thank you yeah no that's great I think that last point about um having that eye for like commercial success is really a good one because yeah it's so easy to be like oh, I just love books <laughs> so much but yeah yeah keeping an eye on like the bookseller charts is is yes one, I think um mm-hmm. Yeah, so I kind of wanted to move to like tap into your experiences of sort of looking at CVs and applicants more specifically. Um, what would you say are the most kind of common mistakes, I guess, that you see in applications, things where you think, um, yeah, that people could have done it differently or, um, yeah, that, that sort of thing? <laughs> We've been getting this quite a lot recently and I don't know why. But people covering letters, so we've got a recruitment system now, so you kind of upload your CV and you can you type in or um, copy and paste to cover a letter. People have written, please find attached my final university thesis. And it's like a 26 page document. And it's almost like, huh? <laughs> what, how is a hiring manager gonna sit through a 23 and read your document? Like it's not relevant to the role that you're applying for. So I would say lazy applications, I think have become a bit of a thing recently. Um, I and mean, that is because there's not there's more jobs now than there were a few months ago, but I think people are just kind of like bulk applying. So same CV, same covering letter, copy and paste. We've had a couple of instances where it's been, I work for Fun Macmillan, but our, the covering letter is, I'd love to work at Penguin. And I almost want to write back and be like, that's really nice. You should probably email them then because it's not me. It's not me, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's almost like- It's, it's really upsetting. <laughs> you know it's just that whole attention to detail and if you've not tailored your covering letter to the role that you're applying for and then you're getting really annoyed that you're getting a I'm really sorry we're not um we're not taking application forward you can't then demand feedback from me because you didn't make any effort in your application so I think it's that um really taking down it is a numbers game but not to the extent where you just need to apply for every single job I think it's about being really intentional about your applications and taking time to do a really good covering letter. Because by the end of a covering letter, I should know whether somebody is gonna be good at this job I want to interview them. And their CV is almost like this backup document. Um, And I think if you're not putting in the time with your covering letter, then you're probably not getting interviews. So I would say take some time um, to do that. And Susie knows that too well, because I think anytime we give a role to Inspired, I'm always like, we really need a good covering letter, not some, and we won't take an application unless it's got a covering letter because I think it's actually somebody's opportunity to shine. I think it's a really good opportunity to show what you can do, why you're a good person for the role, um, why you need, right, this is the role for you, like what skills you've got, et cetera. And that doesn't need to be your thesis from university, but you can make that like a two page document that's quite concise and applied to the job that you're applying for. So I say, I would say, don't be lazy with your applications. I think that's people's biggest downfall. Um, and it's not smart to email and say, who is a hiring manager? If the information isn't in the advert, it's not open available information, just be the best that you can do with what's available to you from the advert and ask the job description. That's great. Yeah, so exercise caution when copy and pasting, basically. Um, yeah, and I guess the cover letter um, is that place where if you haven't had months of experience or you haven't had internships where you can talk about the skills that you've um, got from other places and link them to publishing. So, yeah. Um, yeah, Anne, what, what are your kind of 
Look, if I was, avoid. I wouldn't mind focusing on the whole process actually, because I think at the moment, um, a covering letter is really important. Uh, and if, if it doesn't hang together with CV, then straight away you start asking questions. And because we have so many candidates at the moment, you're automatically giving yourself a little bit of a, a disadvantage by that. So you've got to make sure that, that you put everything in there that you can think that we would want to know about, anything that makes you stand out, anything that really shows your passion for the role that you're applying for. I think then as you go through the process, um, we're finding some that are self, self sort of extracting themselves out of the process. And I'm not certain they really understand that they're doing that. So we have a, because it's an apprenticeship, we have certain things we have to do for eligibility. And one of them is an English and maths initial assessment. And it doesn't matter if you've got, you know, uh, degrees, if you've got A-levels, you've got GCSEs, you all do it. Um, and I don't think they realise that by not doing it and by doing not doing it by the deadline, that they will not move then forward into shortlisting for interviews. So I think they've got to be very clear about understanding the process and be methodical in their approach to it and put their best foot forward. Um, and it is about being proactive through all parts of the process as well, you know, not just expecting us to be in contact with them, but actually, you know, seeking out things, making sure you do things by the deadlines that are required so that you've got the best possible chance of staying in the process all the way through the end. I mean, our system, I have to admit, is not the greatest. Um, and especially to young people, it really is a bit of a barrier. So we've done a couple of sessions actually for schools and for care leavers in particular, helping them through the recruitment system. Um, I'm not saying circumvent it, but actually, you know, what are the best ways of dealing with something that is very much an American, um, but perhaps doesn't recognize English or, or UK qualifications, for example. So it is about being careful when you're using the system as well, that you're actually ticking the right boxes in the right order. So that again, you don't inadvertently push yourself out of the process and not realize it. So it is about attention to detail, as Raki said, um, and being committed to the process all the way through. Uh, yeah, it's all in attention to detail, really. Um, yeah, Susie, um, what about what about you? Um, well, the the kind of common mistakes, I suppose, in applications is is absolutely what Raki and Anne have been been talking about, which is is that attention to detail, so typos, things like that, and. Um, you really want to try and stand out from the crowd at this stage. And the way you do that is by researching that role, um, researching the company um, and figuring out, you know, why you would be the best person for that job. And that's what you want to be doing. It's quite, you know, quite simply, you want to be bringing a lot of you to that role and that company. Um, and, so like you were saying there, the research might not just be on the website. It might be, oh, I saw your books in the bookseller charts and it, what an amazing opportunity it would be to work for such a fantastic company with a diverse list of authors. And I think I could bring this and, da -da, you know, just kind of make it relevant to that company as much as you can, because it will be worth it um, versus like Raki was saying, just doing blanket applications everywhere, still apply to all of the companies if if you feel that there is a connection there and you've you found your niche as to what you'd be bringing. Um, and I think um, there's a there's a kind of balance between a really long life story of a of a covering letter and a, a too short like I'd just like to apply for this job. So. There's, I think, try and get just one side um, of A4 to, um, to, to do the covering letter. And you want to make it clear, like, I want to apply for this job. And then you want to be like, why you want to apply for the job, what you're going to bring for the job, and then thank them for, for reading the application and say how much you're looking forward to hearing from them. And that's the format. And it's not easy, okay? I'm not saying this is the easy bit, but it's, it's worth putting a lot of time into this because if you get an interview you know that the your your applications that's good and the way you're doing it is it is is being is kind of answering the brief if you like yeah and Susie makes a really good point it's that um standing out from the crowd so on average we had an editorial position that was advertised I think in Picador which is one of our imprints and there was 
387 applications we have for that role. So, you know, you, the volume is high for these. There's a lot of competition for roles at the moment. Um, and I was just thinking, as Susie was saying that, what Susie was saying before about um, figuring out what it is that you want to do and what area of the business you want to be in is quite important. And that's, I'm coming from a really privileged position saying that in that I work in HR in a publishing company. So I do understand all the different business areas and what everyone does, but doing a bit of research goes a long way. And this is where companies like Inspired Selection become really helpful because they help you do that work beforehand and help really hone in on your skills. And especially if you're entry level, I think that's a big ask from us, right? That's a big ask for us to really ask you to really understand what you want to do and what you where you want to be based on the fact that you might have done a history degree or you might have done a you know you might have done an apprenticeship before somewhere else and coming in um with slight with a slightly different level of experience and I think you benefit so much from knowing where your transferable skills lie and I mm. think being um something I say quite a lot is that being a fan of an imprint or a particular type of book doesn't necessarily mean that being in that role editorially is going to be the best thing that suits your skills or your skill set. But you can still be involved in an imprint and be in marketing or in production. Or um, we have a lot as data is a big thing in publishing. So we have teams within all of our businesses that work really closely with data across the board. And I think you don't know about these things, but you come in saying, oh, I really want to be an editorial assistant in this imprint, whereas actually your skill set might not apply for that. And that will start to come through when you're not getting through to interviews or you're not getting much feedback on your applications, maybe it's time to take a step back and, you know, have a look at um, what other skills you've got and what other areas that applies to. Sorry to swipe in there, Susie, but you just said something. No, no, no. I, I love it. Um, and now back back on to you from what you just said there, like we often, we will do um, like a roadshow of, of events like this and e- and usually when they're live, like I'll ask to see a show of hands as to, you know, who's applying for jobs in editorial. And it's always about 78 to 80% of people have had their hands up. And then you ask the same question for production uh, and, and it's so much lower or sales, really, really low or marketing. And so, you know, this entry level role could be, it, it doesn't mean you have to be in that role forever, but it's a great you just need to be able to come in and do a really, really good job that is going to help whoever the hiring manager is do their job better. And that's the key. Um, at the same time, you'll learn a whole load about the publishing industry, whichever role you land in. So I think be like, you know, be open to, yeah. to what that role is because we don't know ourselves at that first yeah. no. step. Rosie, can I ask you a question? I know you're hosting this channel, but <laughs> you're doing a, a publishing apprenticeship, right? And obviously it's really interesting from a um, uh, perspective of being able to have an understanding across the business. And obviously, I know you're really involved in how they work, especially within Pearson. Do you think, Rosie, that that's kind of helped you have a different lens on what you think you might want to do within the publishing industry afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. So I um, started... So I've been at Saraband for a year as a publishing assistant um, and I kind of do a mixture of everything like a bit of marketing, bit of publicity, mostly sort of metadata, editorial type tasks. Um, but this apprenticeship has been such an, such an overview and I've learned about finance, which I never would have learned about before. And I think that's given me a really good, I think it's made me better sort of editorially and in terms of thinking about submissions because it makes you think about it as a business as well. And um, when you, and I also do a bit of production, like typesetting and I'm learning how to sort of um, do templates for covers at the moment. And also knowing about the production from the apprenticeship and the kind of specifics about all the different stages of that has been so helpful to just look at everything kind of holistically and, and see how all these departments are so connected um, mm. because, yeah I feel incredibly lucky to have the role that I do actually because I didn't really know what part of publishing I wanted to go into I definitely at uni I was like I want to do editorial um it is definitely the most sort of glamorized um part of the industry and it is great but um I think people don't realize how much creativity is involved in marketing 
or production, which also involves typesetting, which is a kind of design really. Um, and publicity is so sort of people-based and, and there's just so many um, brilliant things about each department. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to learn. There's still so much that I have to learn about all of them. <laughs> yeah. I can say that that's really great um, advertising for the apprenticeship standard. <laughs> And it is because it was written by a group of employers and we're reviewing it now. And, and one of the things I find about the publishing assistant more than any of the others that I'm on is that it really does represent small businesses, large businesses and humongous businesses that are all connected to publishing in one way or another. So to actually give you that rounded view and experience of all the various different types of roles or adaptations to roles is really important because it's entry. Uh, and from entry, you need to be able to move off into all sorts of different route ways. And I think, you know, this does seem to have done that, which I think is, is great credit. And of course, the apprentices that are on it really do range in the jobs that they do in the age range mm -hmm. they are and where they're based in the country. Um, so, I mean, you, Rosie, I have a feeling you were probably on the cohort with my apprentices, actually. Um, and or if not, you're the next one on. Am I uh, so you probably know some of mine, don't you? Yeah, possibly. Yeah. I think I might do, yeah. <laughs> um, but, it's, but again, that's really nice about it. It's because you're creating your own network. Yeah. Um, and you're sharing your experiences and you're coming from so many different organisations that that is hugely beneficial. And hopefully that's something that you will continue with as you move on with your career as well. Um, and as you say, you're part of the Young Publishers too, which is fantastic. And of course, we've got the Young Stationers that exists as well. So there's lots of great avenues to bring this young talent and new talent into the sector and mm. keep moving on and sharing with others. So it's, it's really good. It's really positive. Yeah. And that network's been invaluable, actually. I think I kind of assumed it might not be as, as big a thing, given that it's all remote and we're just on Zooms once a month. But um there's a real kind of wish to sort of share knowledge and because it's such a wide variety of publishers um big like huge publishers to Saraband which is pretty small independent publisher um we all have such different experiences and that's just been amazing to to share those and because of the learner journal you it, there's kind yeah. of an incentive to get those hours in and if you if you're having a zoom call with someone from a different publisher and teaching them about something you do that they might not know about that counts to your time and that's just a really that's a really brilliant thing to have I think yeah yeah it's great um but yeah moving back to you guys <laughs> um so on the kind of flip side of what I asked before are there any things you see in CVs and cover letters that you'd you'd just love to see and that make you really excited and, and sort of keen on a on an um on an applicant i know that's kind of a vague question it might be quite hard to identify what makes an application great but yeah i think just um a really nice clear application is always lovely to to see because it's very easy to see the skills like they pop out of the cv quite quickly and if you're going through 380 applications that and you're having to search you know to see what relevance this person has to the job um, I'd imagine that the ones that that make it easy and are going to go through are the ones that are really clear so I think as publishers we can be quite prose heavy at times so nice clear bullet points I think would be helpful on CVs um, and you know do you sort of make it it personalized as well um, so the CV and covering letter do like they need to tie in, obviously, um, but uh, just to have that really clear statement of why you're interested and make sure one of the key things, make sure that that profile, if you're going to have a sort of profile at the top, um, which is a kind of, I suppose, statement introduction to you at the top of your CV, it matches the job and the covering letter as well. So not not just um, a generic, um, but a, quite a clear. I think the clarity is my overall point. Yeah, that's very interesting. Clarity is so important. Oh, sorry, Raki. Sorry, Anne, go for it. Look, I, I was going to say, just for us, because we are educational, then something in there that, that shows that you have got a passion for helping other mm -hmm. people. So volunteering, um, I mean, maybe you've, you've actually been part of a newsletter uh, editorial team. 
something like that where you know you've 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 given back there's lots of really good mentoring programs for example in schools and with charities that just add that little bit of context to mm. your applying to us as an educational publisher yeah that does help a lot and I think for us we always attach a question to our application so it might be one question it might be two questions it could be anything from if you're applying for the children's area of the business what's your standout childhood children's book and why or in less than 300 words so we do give people the opportunity to kind of show um themselves a little bit because I do think that covering letters and CVs are almost demonized a little bit to be like this really formal document where you can't have any personality but as we all know the creative industry is built on personalities and there's lots of amazing people in our industry that have to have that um eye for commercialism books all of that kind of stuff and that comes from having an interest in having this like personality that's shown right and that's out there so using the questions that people uh, ask for you in your application to kind of show a little bit about yourself and like be a bit cheeky if that's your personality or you know be your true self like there's no point pretending to be something that you're not when you're applying for a job because eventually you'll get found out and you'll have to be yourself when you rock up to work one day um and so just bringing your true self through that application is really important as well and you can do that through clarity as well um which I think Susie makes a really good point I think that um making it as easy as possible because the competition is rife yeah there's so much competition so if you're um, covering letter and your CV are accessible, i.e. really stand out, you've pulled out the skills, even just putting your skill set, quite literally, this, this this bit of experience of mine leans to this bit of your job application and making that a little bit bold or as bullet points, whatever that might be, that's the best way, I think, to get your application noticed from Yeah, that's great. I think it's great to have those kind of like solid, solid tips um, for people. Um, so we touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but obviously this has been a completely exceptional year for publishing. It's been bizarre. And I know in some ways it's been, I think book sales have been up overall, but I think for smaller and medium sized publishers, it's been um, really hard. Um, but there's obviously been some publishers who've had to kind of run away successes and done really well. Um, but in terms of that, I just wanted to ask where you think the industry is right now in terms of trends and recruitment, um, how you think aspiring publishers can use it to their advantage. Um, and if, yeah, if you think that um, the pandemic, remote working and the kind of skills that are needed to do that effectively have changed what um, recruiters are looking for in applications. So big wide question about um, the state of the industry. Um, yeah, I don't know who wants to go first. Um, Raki, if you want to jump in, that'd be great. It's really interesting, isn't it? And I think Susie probably in a bit more of an overview or a bit more of like a helicopter drone kind of view over what's going on, <laughs> especially in London. Um, I think, honestly, it's what well, it's forcing me personally from like an HR perspective to really consider all types of applications. So don't just assume because someone's address you should stop putting your address on your CVs. But if your address is in Manchester, not to assume that um, that person doesn't want to possibly be in London. So why could we not consider somebody in Manchester if their application is really good? Like, so it's giving us internally a bit of a different lean and challenging us in a different way. I would say a lot of our roles at the moment um, are actually across like publishing operations, a bit more of the less traditional publishing roles, I would say. So I think those are really good opportunities to get into publishing. As you mentioned, Rosie, like even just having an understanding of how a box works or how um, the production teams work is invaluable if you then do want to sidestep into or not sidestep and move into another department eventually. And I would say this is most of true true of most publishers that if you want to retain the talent that you've got so if somebody has done this role and then they want to move into another department I'd much rather keep our talent and move them into another area than lose them to a competitor or to Susie you might <laughs> <laughs> um and I think it's just about as you're coming in don't pigeonhole yourself because we haven't pigeonholed you so mm. don't narrow your own application down too far like be open to the other areas of the business and do a bit of research about them because they're actually really fascinating I think all of the, the like 
the materials that you get to look at and work with and the clustings and all that kind of stuff that comes into the publish the uh, production side of the world as well is really really interesting and kind of goes back to how successful you can make a book and that whole commercial side of things so that doesn't mm. really answer your question at all Rosie but um, <laughs> there we go hopefully Susie yeah no it oh. does it does <laughs> that's great I think it's it's great to think that the industry could come out of this kind of more open-minded in a way and just um yeah ready to think about um remote working and 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 people's abilities to move sideways and things like that um yeah Susie if if you want to well, yeah, I was going to challenge the original question, actually, because I think in some ways it's the best time to be um, trying to get into publishing because of this situation. So um, what we've seen over the last 12 months is extraordinary in terms of the openness to hire people not based in London. And I'm so excited about it because I think this is the biggest opportunity we have as an industry to recruit from the most diverse um, pool of people. And that is what the industry is crying out for. And, um, you know, the, no, it's top of everybody's agendas, which is that we need more diversity in our, in our industry at, at several um, sort of levels. Um, and that's, and then there's a real sort of focus on ethnicity, but there's also a focus on the, the male and female um, mix as well and so a lot of the publishers at the entry level are wanting more men at the bottom of the organization because at the moment there's a there's a real sort of um, slant on on males at the top end and obviously this has come out through um, the kind of uh, 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 gender pay gap reports and things like that so and, and then if we can hire diversity geographically and, soci and look at the socioeconomic as well, we need voices from all parts of, of life um, because we need to publish diverse, diversely as well. And so I'm really excited um, to encourage as many people as I can reach now, which is why I was really excited to be on this panel um, it's it's based in Manchester and I, and and I want more northern publishers absolutely in our industry um, and more voices you know I want it to be heard and and I think that's going to be a huge change you know you've got offices opening up there as well and it's only two hours on the train to London so you know for a monthly meeting or something like that it's totally doable um, and, uh, and so I would encourage anyone else listening who's thinking about hiring or, or apply, applying for a job in, in publishing to, to think really broadly, um, because we've seen over the last year that it does work with a lot more remote um, working, 100 percent. So let's let's embrace it is my message. Um, but yeah, there are definite trends um, where we're seeing really high growth. So audio publishers are hiring like there's no tomorrow. I, I think um, that's been a huge trend. Um, and um, I, the other one I was going to just say is um, uh, on the, the type of interviews. So now we're not doing a lot of stuff via video. So if you haven't practiced already, because um, we've talked a lot about the application stage, do make sure you're, you're comfortable with doing a video interview. Um, we've got a blog on video interviews on our website as well, um, which you're welcome to kind of read through. But the key kind of things there are just to make sure your background is clear, um, that you've got good kind of internet that's it's stable so you can have that conversation and that there are no noises sort of around a bit like a telephone interview so if you if your housemate's about to make some toast that's going to set the fire alarm off perhaps ask them to to wait an hour or you know just make sure everybody's aware that between nine and ten or whenever your interview is it's like this is really really important because you don't want any distractions um ideally you know cat jumping onto your lap kind of thing or you know, we've seen it all to be quite honest and and actually we're all human and if something happens then it's not the end of the world but you want to be in in the best spot to to give you your your best um your best efforts and enjoy that that interview and that conversation um yeah I think that I mean I've got a lot more but it's all um 
I think Anne's probably got more to add as well. I don't want to kind of step on toes. Yeah, um, I wondered what that's been like from an educational publisher perspective. Um, well, I think, um, I mean, obviously our particular sector of publishing has had its ups and downs over this last year, obviously with GCSEs and A-levels. So it's mm. been incredibly busy, um, even though we might not have been recruiting as much. That is now beginning to change and, and absolutely taking on board what Susie and Raki say is that, you know, it's, it's not necessarily about where a site is positioned anymore. So, you know, you can look at such a diverse range of individuals across the country and even internationally, as long as they've got a right to work and they meet the eligibilities of an apprenticeship, then that's mm. fine because they've got to work in the UK. I do think the SFA is going to have to look at its funding rules because obviously that was written around everybody going into a specific workplace, which is not the case. Um, and also obviously, uh, you know, apprentice providers have been doing remote learning, which many of them are, are planning to continue with a version of that. So again, accessibility is there for individuals. You're not going to have to necessarily go to a campus, a training centre or anything like that on a regular basis. So that really is quite exciting. Um, and for us, we've, we've just had five vacancies out for apprentices in the publishing assistant. Um, and we've actually been able to put it out at a regional level up in the north of the country, as well as where we were in Oxford and London. And that's been fantastic. And the interest that we got was super and the calibre of candidates was brilliant as well. Mm. So that really, for me, is, is opening up a lovely expanse of individuals that perhaps wouldn't have come to us before, wouldn't have even considered us because we were always predominantly down in London from our publishing part of the business. So I think this has given us opportunities. I think the other thing is that we've moved far, far, further and faster into digital learning and all that that brings. So it's quite exciting. You know, we're looking at gameology, we're looking at online learning platforms. So you need to develop learning content for that in a different way than before. So from a publishing perspective, that's really exciting. You know, you're, you're working with systems um, and that opens up a whole new raft of things. Raki was talking about data, you know, data analysts, project management, um, business analysts, even cybersecurity, you know, those are all the things that are really required of a publishing business. And with us, we do it bigger <laughs> and, and internationally. So I'm, I'm hoping that actually this is a, a bit of a turning point and it opens us up more as a brand that people understand as being one where we can offer a great um, career and then they can come in and then work their way through and potentially go anywhere. I have one of my former apprentices who now works in Dubai and every now and again sends us a nice little picture on social media. Oh, <laughs> lovely. Hugely jealous. <laughs> Just He's doing really, really, really well. And we've got others that are moving around the business and in doing incredibly well. And starting, you know, coming in from sixth form, um, not necessarily all of them do that, but I can think of a couple that have. And that is great. So I think, yeah, it's been a tough year. But it's actually quite exciting. Brilliant. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah, and it's it's really exciting as well, I think, to think about um, what impact the opening out of the industry and jobs within the within the industry will have on what we publish. Mm. Um, because I think it's easy to yeah. sort of separate the two things and think, oh, we need to publish diversely or mm. you know, high diversely, but really the two are so hand in hand. They are, yeah. absolutely. Mm. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's just... that actually, in the review of the apprenticeship standard that we're looking at at the minute, the publishing assistant, one of the things that's pretty high up in our thinking is actually making sure that we've got more in there around the user experience mm -hmm. from accessibility and diversity. Uh, and that's been a direct result of the pandemic and making sure that when we're talking about all of our different content and its different mediums, that we are producing it in a way that's right for the audience. Yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. Actually, before we go to um, audience questions, I've got a few that have come in now. Um, I just wanted to quickly plug an event that SYP are doing next week, which is sort of relevant to that. So cheeky. Sorry. <laughs> it's free. I'm, really so I'm not gaining anything. <laughs> um, it's, it's, so it's, it's about apprenticeships and training in publishing. Um, we've got Helen Boogler, um, Vim Baishere and two apprentices two apprentices, Jess Stevens and Eleanor Rose, who both work for Bloomsbury and Helen and Vimbai are both skills coach 
skills coaches well Vimbai used to be a skills coach and Helen is currently the skills coach for the LDN apprenticeship publishing assistant apprenticeship um and we'll be talking about apprenticeships and publishing and how to get into them what they mean for the industry um right. and Jess particularly is going to talk I think about um dyslexia in publishing and, and accessibility I think she wrote something really in interesting for Bloomsbury about um making content more accessible for people with dyslexia so that kind of user experience I think really ties into that but yeah I'm finished with the self-promotion now <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. so yeah I've got some audience questions um that have come in now if you guys are happy for me to start asking those um so I've got one question saying how much of an influence does a publishing masters have in the application process well, with the 300 other people that have got one too, which is probably not loads at this point. Um, no, that's kind of a little bit belittling of that, of the Masters. I think the Masters is an amazing thing, but you have got a competition. Everyone that you've done the Masters with, plus everyone from every other university that year and the year before and probably the year before that. So it is a very good thing to have, but it's almost become a thing that everybody has, if that makes sense. So you still need to be standing out in your applications I would say you do learn a lot in that master's you do have a bit more of an overview but I think it's become there's a misconception that you need it to get into the industry and I would disagree with that need for the master's I would say mm. I, what I, I would say it's experience more than anything you know if you've got a master's great but you've got to have those years experience behind you as well because you'd probably be in line management role at that point maybe a senior content producer or something if not higher so um i, I agree I, I think it's a lovely to have but it's not necessarily going to get you through the door i'd i'd agree with all of that and i'd just say use it to your advantage because if you do have a master's in publishing then there is no excuse that your covering letter isn't absolutely on point in terms of you know you've studied all of the roles across publishing in that master's and you will have probably been on a placement or two so absolutely use it to your advantage but don't think that it's going to make you stand out just having it like you need to make sure you stand out yeah that's those are some great answers I think um, so another one, we've sort of touched on this in terms of working from home, but I think this is a really important question. Um, some disabled and chronically ill folks have and will always need to work part time from home. Um, what specific supports are publishing houses putting in place to invite and sustain disability in the industry? Um, yeah. I mean, if, if I answer that one, um, I mean, we have, and, and we're lucky, we're, we're a big organisation, so we've got a lot of HR systems and occupational health systems around our staff. We also have employee reference groups and mental health first aiders. We also tap into a number of different uh, systems and, and, and third party um, organisations as well. So people with disabilities, people with any particular needs at all, are pretty well served, you know, in terms of just reaching out and saying what they want, or actually having a manager who does the reaching out for them. Um, I think all of us in business at the moment are very much focused on mental health and well-being, and ensuring that anybody that works for us, wherever they are, are actually as supported as they can be, both personally, both for their families, but also enabling them to do the jobs that they've got to do. I mean, I particularly find, and I'm sure others will as well, that um, our staff are just prepared to work their socks off. And we actually have to tell them to slow down. Yeah. Give themselves time. Yeah. Log off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Log off, you know. And, you know, the apprenticeship, you're allowed to do 20% through work time, and we give them more than that. But mm. even though I'm still telling them, take the time. It's your time. It's our investment in you. And that applies to anyone. Our training providers also are incredibly well experienced in supporting apprentices with particular needs um, and can, can pull down additional funding to support any specialist resources as well. So the training provider is a really important partner in all of this. That's great. Echo, it's really great. Echo what Anne said as well. We are motivated to make that work as an employer, aside from the fact that we have an obligation to which I don't believe should come into it there is a motivation to want to make everybody feel safe and comfortable wherever they're working and I personally speak to your HR team hopefully your HR team is all really approachable but we've got a lot of knowledge that managers might not know about or get your manager to come speak to us on your behalf um but there's lots of things that we can put in place and actually um 
it's quite straightforward for us to be able to put those things in place and we want to do that. So I would say to not um, be worried about coming forward about asking for anything because we would want the help, I would say. And I think for those individuals who are working for smaller businesses or looking to work for smaller businesses, just don't be afraid to be honest about what your needs are, um, because at the end of the day, that business will want you to perform the best that you can in the most comfortable environment that works for you. So, you know, do do be brave and say what it is that you actually need. And it might be that you need to educate the the business owner or your line manager but that's that they will want to be um educated to to understand your needs as well um but i think there's there's kind of without an hr department um you know that there, there might not be somebody that thinks that i mean they should but there might not be somebody that thinks i wonder if everybody's got everything that they need so just don't be angry about it just let them know what it is that you need um so that they can provide that for you yeah yeah I think yeah hopefully it'll be good to see publishers realize that I think having events like this has been great because it's been accessible to so many people who might not have been able to come to live events yes and um I think yeah I've seen quite a lot of understandable frustration of um especially people at universities who've asked for um recorded lectures and the universities have said that we can't do that and now that it's needed for people who are like able-bodied and don't have those needs it's suddenly like it's just an achievable so, yeah mm. I hope that um this um this this move will be kind of continued in terms of taking into account accessibility um so thank you for that question that was really important one um there's another question which is I have an easy time tailoring my cover letter for smaller companies, but I have difficulties doing this for huge companies. How do you figure out what makes one huge company unique to another? Oh, mm. that is a good question. It is. It's, go for it, Raki. I was going to say your covering letter shouldn't be about the company. It should be about you. Um, so you might need to allude to the company a little bit or a little bit about your knowledge of the company, but um, this is why I always say you need to ask for a job description. So most companies, if you ask to see a job description for a role you've applied for, they will send it to you um, and you are able to then kind of really tailor your covering letter to what the company needs and then it will become a bit more natural in terms of a really personal covering letter for that company, if that makes sense. I mean, I would just say that when you're applying to a big company is, is go on their website and have a look at who they are and what they stand for. Where do they operate? What is their key activity that, that your part of that business is going to be working within? Don't try and, and tackle the whole business because it's hugely complex, but just focus in on the part of the business where this job role is, is situated. Find out about that a bit more. But as, as Raki said, the covering letter is about yourself. But if you can tailor it and use language that fits into that part of the business, then, then you've got a hook um, and the reader will know that you understand. They don't expect you to really understand it very well because it is complex, but at least you've made the effort and, and that will come through in the covering letter. I think I'd just add as well, if, if you're finding there's a block applying to large companies, like they're a bit overwhelming, but you're finding it's easier to write to smaller companies, that might be telling you something as well that you just feel more comfortable with the thought of working for a smaller company um, to start with. Just throwing good that. Point. Really good That's point. That's a really great point. Um, yeah, this is another good question. And I think um, something that lots of people think about, I know I was when I was thinking about getting into publishing. Um, so I'm just finishing my second year at university and have a long summer before I start my year abroad. The next two summers, I'm going to have a lot of free time. What's the best thing I can do to prepare for the industry? Great question. Internship sounds like a good idea to me. Mm. I don't know what uh, my colleagues think. Yeah, I think if you can if you can do a paid internship, that would be brilliant. Um, but if not, um, get have get a job that's going to give you that transferable skill. So there, it doesn't have to be in publishing. Actually, it's 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 better to go and get a job somewhere else where you can get 
good, like good office experience, to be honest. Um, but try and find something that's enjoyable. So I, I think I said at the start, like I had a really great job where I was or, organizing tours for this educational theatre company. So they go around to schools and perform this um, educational thing on why it's important to study for your GCSEs. And so I'd go and um, book the tours in over the summer for the the winter term or whatever. And then when I was in term at university, they'd do the feedback forms. So I'd go in at night and just sort of process those forms. So it's great because it gave me really good um, sort of office skills, but also quite enjoyable at the same time. They didn't come to my school because I did not do my studying properly for my GCSEs. <laughs> could have missed out on that one. You must, um, you must have missed the performance. Yeah, probably. Um, I think also, um, I think people really dismiss the, uh, the value of volunteering or being able to kind of help young people where English isn't their first language to read or to get more involved in the industry. Um, tuition is also an amazing thing for students, especially if you're looking to get into um publishing you can be a, mm. an English tutor for GCSE even younger um, mm. and just using your skills in that way because actually those are you get really good transferable skills from that anyway that can come into the industry so um this is kind of just smiling a little bit but you can use that time to do something good where you can have something transferable mm. and I think apprenticeships what exactly what Susie put, say, it said please don't do an apprenticeship that you're not paid for it doesn't sit right particularly with me in HR that anybody's being unpaid to do any kind of apprenticeships but um lots of people get lots of apprenticeships and I think if you want to stand out doing something a little bit different as well um that can then relate back to the industry so thinking outside the box a little bit I would say mm, mm. yeah I think get creative with it is a really I think bookstagram can be really useful to just like it doesn't take too much time um and it's just evidence that you really care about the industry yes. you're kind of like trying to um get in you're like aware of the community and maybe talking to publishers about doing reviews and that kind of thing yeah. um, and also have a lot of friends that have worked in bookshops over summer and then you might be able to get involved with um helping out with events yeah. um which is really useful and if you pay attention you'll see what's selling and i think that's probably really so well. any, if you can't if you can't yeah SYP brilliant mm. um you must join SYP because the the all the events are just amazing they're all, always full of really good hints and tips from loads of publishing experts and and it's a great network as well mm-hmm. um but I was just going to say like if you can't if you really can't find anything to do then why why not organize your own event Mm. Uh, create a book club like do something and we haven't spoken about social media which I was going to talk about as well which is you know you need to be active um on social media especially if you're going to have that in your applications but for the right reasons so just watch out maybe give your social media a bit of a clean um make sure it's all um all appropriate because we do look at the the um social media just to check it's all okay (laughs) yes it's a good point (laughs) yeah that's some really great advice I think and also on SYP um it is 30 pounds a year to join but there's also lots of free events that you don't have to be a member for and you also don't have to be a member for the mentorship um and London have currently um secured some sponsored um some sponsored places um, on on the membership and SYP North is looking into doing that. As well. Oh, great. Yeah. So if you're, if you don't have the money for it, then we're <laughs> trying to support people with that as well. Um, I'll just ask one more question um, and then wrap up. Um, so do you have any tips for how to reach out to publishers if they don't have any applications going at that moment or should you reach out to those publishers at all? It's really interesting. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'll let you answer I've, that one, Racky. Well, I think working in HR, it's actually it's not great to have lots of speculative CVs, right? So I don't try not to sit on speculative CVs. I don't think it's fair. Um, so I just don't accept them. I think using your socials, Twitter, Instagram, all of that to interact with people that work there already, that's already a good thing to be doing. I would say reaching out and being like, if any roles come up in editorial, please let me know. I'm not going to remember to let you know because about 100 people 
ask me the same thing I'm not honestly not going to remember to let you know so keeping an eye out on the website it's like if we've got a job we're not keeping it to ourselves I promise you we need to put it out there to get applications so it's going to be on the website it's going to be advertised some on some social media at some point um so for me personally it doesn't help anybody stand out if you're reaching out being like I'm really interested in this department please let me know if anything comes up I don't think there's a benefit to it personally um I'm sure other people have other views on that, but I don't think it's um, necessarily a helpful thing to do. No, I totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. It just gets lost. And yeah. uh, where does it go? That, that's the other thing. It can sit with an individual and that individual might not be connected to any of the vacancies mm-hmm. that are going to be coming up. So it's, it's really down to those that are interested to keep tabs on the website, look at what's coming up um, and then be proactive in applying for it. Um, yeah. Yeah, you'd be better off probably using your time to like, if there's a particular company you want to go and work for, just just um, make sure you're following them on your socials and you're liking their posts or commenting on it just because, you know, that interaction, you'd be better off spending the time doing that, I think. And also it's helping. So as soon as that job does come up, you've already done your research because you've been following them. So yeah, that's what I would suggest. Register with an agency. I would say register with an agency. Yeah, because like, have you ever heard of Inspired? <laughs> but yeah, Inspired are very good when they're not stealing people from our business. Okay. I'm not. No, excuse me. Never steal people. Never. Steal no. People. But agencies are a really good way in, and I think um, obviously Inspired Selection is amazing. But there's lots of agencies out there, and we use Inspired Selection for specialist. Um, publishing roles but we also do have like a technology department or HR department or finance department and then we wouldn't necessarily need to use a specialist finance agency in that um, sorry publishing agency in that sense we could but it also helps to broaden our um call of candidates if we go wider so register with an agency that knows what they're talking about you know the ones that really interact just so that you're on their radar as well even if they don't have jobs at the time you get lots of access to lots of information like CV mentioned their blog about interview skills they actually have so much probably one of the better agencies on social media in terms of stuff that they put out there mm. um because that helps you too so <laughs> agencies are a very good tool I would say use them right thank you okay so I think that is our time now um thank you so much everyone um that was brilliant um I learned a lot and I hope everybody watching did as well and thank you for those questions I'm sorry we didn't have time to answer them all um but yeah they were really brilliant so thank you thank you thank you thanks Rosie thank you very much well done Rosie thanks